Hello and welcome. I'm the Collector of Ancients and today we have the Comic Collector for the DOS computer. IBM MS-DOS Tandy 640k RAM, hard drive required, video, mono, CGA, EGA, MCGA, VGA, Tandy, DOS 2.0 or greater, 3.5 and 5.4 and inch discs included, not copy protected. IBM or compatible. This is uh, an interesting little novelty nowadays, I suppose. Um, I think it's still really cool. So this was made by Ablesoft, and this was produced in 1993. Um, I guess they used the Overstreet price guide for this. So it's basically a comic inventory system that has a built-in price guide. Um, says here includes data for over 30,000 comics. Let's go ahead and read the back of the box here. The Comic Collector lets you take control of your comic book collection. For the first time ever, you can organize and value your collection without ever cracking open a price guide. Use your computer to track just which comics you have, what condition they're in, and how much they're worth. You'll be amazed at how much this state-of-the-art software will help you enjoy comic collecting even more. Inventory all your comics quickly and easy. Just enter the quantities of the comics you own. The comic collector does the rest. Keep track of all your comics and just how much they are worth. Adjust your inventory with just one keystroke or mouse click. Instant access to any title or any comic. Select comics to work with based on number, character appearances, price, or your inventory. Easily move from one title to another without the hassle of moving from menu to menu. Track annuals, specials, king-sized hardcovers, or trade paperbacks. Create reports and lists based on any criteria. Full reporting to screen or printer, inventory, artist, writers, comic values, character appearances, origins, cameos, and crossovers. Equity report, want lists, high demand, special lists. Some reports by title, publisher, or inventory. Create checklists to take to comic conventions or your local dealer. That's pretty cool. Instantly list all the appearances of your favorite character. That is actually pretty awesome, too. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Combine multiple report options to control report format. The best comic collection software is also the easiest to use. Integrated help files give on-screen assistance. Well, that's always good. Uh, full documentation includes an 80-page manual. Yes, this is back when you got manuals with things. Big ones, too. 80-page manual and a guided step-by-step -step tutorial. Ablesoft provides free technical support for any problems or questions you might have, which, okay, that feature is no longer in service. So, you'll have to do without that. Uh, included free, complete comic book data with prices, artists, writers, writers, publishing data, character appearances, and origins some from Silver Age to present. So this does not include uh, prices for Golden Age comics, which I thought was a little bit surprising. Um, it's only Silver Age and up. You can modify stuff to add your own uh, to the to the database. So. I mean, if you wanted to add Golden Age stuff, then you could, but this only comes prepackaged with Silver Age prices and information. But we have Marvel, DC, Image, Valiant, Dark Horse, Dell, Gold Key, Malibu, Pacific, Eclipse, First, and Comico, and many more. Data from Overstreet Publications. You gotta say Overstreet, because, yeah, I mean, look at that. It's not look like it's just yelling at you <laughs> anyway uh, available monthly updates this was kind of cool I think Ablesoft's low-cost updates automatically bring you your comic database up to date with new prices and data direct from Overstreet the leader in comic values available monthly on a disc or over your modem so if you registered your copy of this I guess they would mail you a floppy disk with updated prices every month or you could have them just send it to you over over your modem um, I don't know how long that this service went on I would be curious to know when it actually ended 
Um, as I said, this came out in 1993. So I, I don't know how long they supported this. But. Organize comics any way you want. Prices maintained for three comic conditions. Near mint, fine, good, etc. Uh, view comics by character appearances, origins, want flags, cameos, special flags, crossovers, high demand flags, number of guys named Phil, increasing or decreasing values. Easily add any new title or comics. Uh, by Applesoft Incorporated, 4824, George Washington Highway, Suite 103, Yorktown, Virginia, 23692. Phone number is 800-545-9009. And, yeah, there you go. Let's, let's open it up and take a look. And right there, you can see price and data update when you register. So, I'm really curious how, how long that service went, went on. So we have here, Ablesoft, there's a little envelope here. Let's see what's in here. Okay, there's our three and a half inch floppies. Um, I already installed this so that we wouldn't have to wait for the video, so no need to pull these out right now. But let's take a look at the other stuff here. Um, here are the five and a quarter inch. It's four of them. Right, let's take a look at this. So we have kind of a, a new little newspaper, Comic Collector Monthly. So I'm curious if this actually came in the box, because um, it was in an envelope thing in here. So I don't know if this came in the box or if this was the owner's monthly update. I would be curious to, to know about that too. Um, let's fold it out here. So we got a little newspaper, Comic Collector Monthly. Batman's Doug Munch, Mo Munch, Munch. No. Doug Munch. Oh, that's the guy's name. That's not a word. Okay. <laughs> uh, interview by Todd Howard. I'm pretty sure that's not the Todd Howard who is famous for. Um, Elder Scrolls. <laughs> I imagine it's a completely different Todd Howard. <laughs> That's kind of funny though. <laughs> Sorry Todd Howard, whichever one wrote this. I, I, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, thank you for writing this. <laughs> uh, Doug Moench, 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 Moench. Go with Moment. Has become one of comics hottest writers in the last two years. His work on Batman has earned him praise across the industry. Batman 500, his most recent and well-known work, introduces the new Batman and is featured on our cover. Many comic readers do not realize that Doug has been in comics for over 25 years. Not only is he a cutting-edge writer of the 90s, he is also one of comics classic writers. His work has ranged from Master of Kung Fu. Thor, James Bond, early 80s Batman, Detective Comics, and many of today's Batman titles. Doug recently spoke with Comic Collector Monthly about his early work in comics. That's cool. So they have like some interviews with um with some uh, some of the, the people, the creators, comic creators and artists and such. That's that's pretty interesting. It's like a So this is volume one, issue two. So I don't have issue one. I got. I gotta wonder though. Is is this? I, I don't think this would have came in the box originally. I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Why are high grade copies so hard to find? <laughs> uh, keep in mind, this is the world before eBay, where you could search and find just about anything at any time. Uh, well, in the world of collectibles, there are a few universals. The individual agendas of collectors are as varied as there are kinds of collectibles. Collectors may want items related to historical events or periods. They may seek out things that are traditionally famous or be totally motivated by internal needs that only they understand. Collectors may frantically attempt to recapture their childhood with items they actually possessed as youngsters or with items they wanted to possess as children, but somehow were never able to acquire. 
But among all myriad individual collecting criteria, one thing emerged as a universal concept. Whether it be antique furniture or matchbook covers, coins or stamps, big little books. Hey, big little books. Um, uh, side tangent. Um, Walter Koenig. Uh, guy who, actor who played uh, Chekhov in Star Trek. He is a big collector of big little books. He has a very impressive collection of those things. Pretty cool. Uh, check it out. There's a video somewhere on YouTube. He's showing it off. It's pretty interesting. He also collects uh, uh, pinback buttons, which was interesting. He seems like a pretty cool guy. Anyway, uh, big little books or comics. The vast majority of enthusiasts want the items they collect to be as close to the original condition of manufacture as possible. That has not changed. This key idea may seem painfully obvious to those who've been comic book collectors for a while, but to those newly arrived on the scene, it might not be so obvious. To gain even more insight into why condition continues to be the holy grail of comic collectors... Sorry, I lost it. Holy grail of comic collectors, consider the law of entropy. This law suggests that the natural order is for things to deteriorate from a state of order to a state of chaos, to literally decay from a well-ordered state back to the original elemental particles. So it goes with comic books. The deteriorate, de ugh, deterioration or aging process of comic books can be better understood by investigating the nature of the beast, so to speak. Comic books are fundamentally a mechanical device. That is, comic books, as with all books, are intended to move. They move every time we open them to read the print and look at the pictures inside. The mechanical device concept is often overlooked, and yet is one of the most important reasons that comics seem to age so quickly. The flexible paper that is used in the manufacture of comic books is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, its flexibility allows the mechanical object to work. On the other hand, the flimsy assemblage of fragile materials hovers the edge of destruction with every reading. This Catch-22 is often the source of philosophical and passionate debate among collectors. If one enjoys a comic by using it for the original purpose it was manufactured, the de facto result is a reduction in condition, even with the most careful reading techniques. Not only that, but ironically for collectors, no matter how carefully one handles comic books, they age anyway. Another factor affecting the condition of comics is the fact that no one in the first three decades of publication thought much about preserving them, protecting them from the... See high grade inside. From the... Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, okay, let's unfold carefully. There we go. Uh, from the... Uh, let me find it. Let me find... There we go. Continued from front. Uh, what? Protecting them from the elements or to even treat them with much respect. After all, it's this very fact that they were manufactured so cheaply that allowed them to be sold for only a dime. This 10 cent cost is the very reason comics were within the budget range of the, imagi of the average American kid. If comics were not manufactured as a deterioration time bomb, the hobby as we know it might not ev have ever gotten off the ground. And yet another piece of the comic book condition puzzle Condition puzzle falls into place as we remember that they were not originally manufactured to last very long in the first place. And this leads us to the typical degradation scenario. These elements of destruction can be loosely described as follows. First, the publisher selects the cheapest materials possible in order to maximize profit. Newsprint, a highly unstable mixture of wood pulp, acids, and tannins, is chosen. This ensures that the deterioration process will begin literally at the time of paper manufacture. Second, the printer handles the job in the fastest and most economical way possible, caring about the handling of the product only to the minimum required for acceptance by the customer. And in the first three decades of comic book production, consumers weren't all that picky. After the printer's contribution to reduce condition, it's time for the third villain to enter the picture. The bindery, where the folding, stapling, and trimming process is accomplished. It fulfills its oblig obligatory, obligatory role by 
mistrimming about 30% of the run, miscutting about 20% of the run, misfolding about 15% of the run, off-center stapling 25% of the run, and generally mistreating about 100% of the run. This mistreatment process ends up with comic books being stacked on pallets and tied with bundling wire, which of course contributes even more damage, especially to the books unlucky enough to end up in contact with the bundling wire, usually with the worst assaults at the top and bottom of the stack. Number four is our tra in our tragic play is the distributor. He is given the opportunity to treat the comics with disrespect by throwing, and we do mean throwing, the various individual store allotments into boxes for delivery. When they finally arrive at the drugstore or newsstand, the comics are placed by the fifth condition villain onto the shelves, or worse, into wire racks that bend, crease, and tear with every push and shove. After all this, it's time for the ultimate preservation villain to enter the picture. None other than you and I in our youth. Imagine, if you will. A scene that has been repeated uncountable times across this fair continent. A ten-year-old rides up to the front door of the local pharmacy clad in t-shirt, blue jeans, and sneakers. The youthful consumer enters the store and moves directly to the newsstand on the front walk just inside the store. After an agonizing selection process, the young buyer chooses a copy of Flash Comics 105, the first issue, which has already been reduced from its original condition to, if conditions were fortunate, a very fine copy before the consumer even has an opportunity to purchase it. That's an important idea to remember and helps the co collector to conceptualize the comics from 1933 through 1969 were rarely in mint condition, even fresh from the rack. The younger purchaser plunks down his dime, neatly but firmly folds the comic lengthwise, and places it snugly into a back pocket for the long bicycle ride home. Upon arriving there, this early collector then proceeds to treat the comic in the traditional way, that is, folding back and creasing each and every page, starting with the cover in turn as it is read. This fold em as you go style is ergonomically efficient as it allows the reader to hold the comic with one hand while maneuvering a rapidly melting popsicle with the other. At the conclusion of the reading process, the comic is tossed unceremoniously into a drawer, closet, or under the bed for temporary storage to be retrieved later for rereading or possible trade with another thrifty comic fan in the neighborhood. The usual final merciful conclusion to this modern day preservation tra tra ugh, tragedy is for a parent to trash the comic, now in well read, very good or worse condition. Use it for packing dishes, utilizing the absorptive, uh, absorptive <laughs> surface for a coaster to replace the scrap doodling paper by the phone, helping the puppy train itself to be location specific, or finally to fulfill its ultimate destiny in the trash with the other magazines and newspapers. After all, it was only a cheaply mass produced, purposely inexpensive, temporarily entertaining comic book. Before its demise, this folded, split, torn, spine-rolled, faded, stained, bent, creased, marked on, soiled, smeared, smudged, and ripped temporary piece of juvenile entertainment penetrated the paste, whew, became a permanent part of the happy memories that will be forever be nostalgically recalled by its owner. Thus, we can understand two universals that are true in the fields of comic book collecting. First, that the chances for pre-1970 comic books, and some may argue any era of comic books, to be in high grade are actually extremely low. I would say this uh, is true of most any uh, popular collectible a day. Look at Pokemon cards, for a great example. Magic cards. Um, trading cards in general follow a lot of the same... Uh, criteria as comic books, especially trading cards that are used in trading card games and were shuffled a lot. It's very hard to find, uh, say, like Power 9 in really ni nice condition anymore, for example. Um, uh, where was I? 
Uh, doo -doo -doo. The chances for pre-1970 comic books, and some may argue any era of comic books to be in high grade, are actually extremely low. This means that the number of copies of any given issue in high grade are significantly lower than the number of copies in middle and lower grades. And second, that people who collect these quasi-antique newsprint gems want them to be as identical as possible to their original manufactured condition for the most basic of reasons. Aesthetics. Once one realizes that a high-grade copies are truly scarce items, B, most collectors appreciate this fact, and C, most collectors prefer higher-grade copies, then one can see how the story, old story of supply and demand applies. Yep, and I would say that is still strongly in effect with a lot of collectibles today, uh, including video games, and, uh, particularly video games, comics, and uh, car uh, cards, trading cards. And, and even for uh, action figures. If you look at uh, vintage Star Wars or Ninja Turtles or Masters of the Universe, G.I. Joe, a lot of these things very greatly on condition. And you know, finding really nice condition uh, examples of these things can be very hard as they were cheap toys for kids who played with them. Most got played with. Just like most Pokemon packs got opened so if you want to find a first edition pack of base set unopened, it's going to be several thousand dollars because they all got opened pretty much. Anyway, I thought this was really interesting. Uh, there's an, oh, a whole section here. It, I think this is a short section on grading your comics. Sure, I'll read this. This is this is not very long. Um, let's see, maybe I can turn this. Hopefully I'm not boring you with, with reading this. I'll get to the software in a minute. Um, but here we go. Grading your comics. This is reprinted for permission from the Overstreet Comic Book Price Guide 23rd edition. Copyright Robert M. Overstreet. Oh, Overstreet was the guy's name. Okay. I thought it was like Overstreet. Like these are the street prices or something. No. <laughs> anyway. Uh, before a comic book's true value can be assessed, its condition or state of preservation must be determined. In all comic books, the better the condition, the more desirable and valuable the book. Comic books in mint condition will bring several times the price of the same book in poor condition. It also applies to trading cards and action figures and uh, video games. That's why something new sealed is insane, as you might say compared to used. Anyway, therefore, it is very important to be able to properly grade your books. Comics should be graded from the inside out, so the following comic book areas should be examined before assigning a final grade. Check the inside pages, inside spine, and covers, and outside spine and covers for any tears, markings, brittleness, tape, soiling chunks, out, or other defects that would affect the grade. Okay, so this is about grading your comics yourself, and like, deciding what condition they're in. Um, not as I f expected, for some reason, uh, sending comics in to be graded by CGC or something. <laughs> After all the steps have been taken, the above steps, the above steps have been taken, then the reader can begin to consider an overall grade for his or her book. The grading of a comic book is done by simply looking at the book and describing its condition, which may range from absolutely perfect newsstand condition, mint, to extremely worn, dirty, and torn, poor. Numerous variable influences... Oh god, uh, that music. Uh, hopefully you can't hear that. There's... The, the floor is vibrating. Someone is playing music very loud. Sorry about that. Anyway, numerous variables influence the evaluation of a comic book's condition and all must be considered in the final evaluation, as grading is the most subjective aspect of determining a comic's value. It is very important that the grader be careful and not allow wishful thinking to influence what the eyes see. I see that a lot. That, that, yeah. I've had a lot of experience with people who think it's much, much, much better than it is. It is also very important to realize that older comics in mint condition are extremely scarce and are rarely advertised for sale. Most of the higher grade comics advertised range from very fine to near mint. So we have a scale here. Mint. Perfect in every way. Near mint. Nearly perfect. Very fine. Slight wear. Fine. Minor wear. Very good. 
average used condition, average used comic. Good, large defects. Fair, soiled, ragged, or unattractive. And poor, severe damage. Send in your registration card for a free subscription to Comic Collector Monthly. This is really cool. I would like to get more uh, issues of this. I, I think this is really interesting. Um, anyway, uh, Comic Collector Monthly, right there, uh, by Abelsoft, um, our new user. Yeah, so, it, okay, it also came with this. This is a free Overstreet price and data update. This is, I guess, a kind of registration form? Probably. If you collect older comics pre-Silver Age or comic cards, don't miss out on the great prices for this additional data. Okay, so you got the Silver Age to present in this box here with the software, and once you register, it, it does say free. It does, it, doesn't say it's like, yeah, it also says free, so it's not charging you anything extra. But if you register, you get the pre-Silver Age uh, data. Oh man, I would love to have one of those pre-registration, or one of those registration discs. So I could get the updated data, and, and more of these things. These things are awesome. But uh, you put in your, your information here, and answer some questions. Okay, here's some questions. I will ask you. You can tell me in the comments below. <laughs> Did you receive the software as a gift? Yes or no? Who selected the software for purchase? Child, teen, or adult? Purchase software at blank. What price did you pay? Blank. Ages of collectors, 12 or under, 13 to 17, 18 to 29, 30 to 39, or 40 plus. How many total comics do you have? Under 1,000. I like how it's just under 1,000. And then it just goes, all the other selections are just a thousand or more. Like, these are some serious comic collectors here. <laughs> I mean, I probably do have over a thousand comic. Yeah, okay, yes. I, I probably have like 10,000 or more. But still. <laughs> uh, yeah, the options are under, under 1,000, 1 to 2,500, uh, 2,500 to 5,000, 5,000 or more. How many hours a week do you spend with your collection? Do you collect comic cards? Okay, I do not collect comic cards as such, but I do own a lot of comic cards, so I guess you could say yes, maybe? <laughs> Even though I don't actively go after them, I just kind of end up with them. What kind of display do you use? Mono, VGA, CGA, Super VGA, or EGA? Uh, which size disc drives do you have? Three and a half inch or five and a fourth? So I think I have a VGA monitor, I want to say, here. Okay. Which we will look at in a minute. Uh, if you're still watching. <laughs> so, sorry this is a long video, but I just kind of wanted to take my time with it. Um, so I have both a 5 and a 4th and 3 and a half there, as well as a CD-ROM drive. That's a mm, yeah, big thing. <laughs> How did you find out about the comic collector? A friend, a comic dealer, at the store, Comic-Con, magazine, or other? Um... How did I find about the, find out about this? I think it was uh, an internet search. You know, the information superhighway. <laughs> Is Windows your primary operating system? On this computer, no. On all my other computers, mostly, yeah. Uh, type of system, oh, 486 plus. This is a 486 DX2, 66 megahertz, uh, computer that I just built actually. Just finished building it and I'm very proud of it and it works very nicely. I'll make another video talking about it later. Oh, this is all about Comic Collector. Uh, memory of uh, RAM over 4 megabytes. Um, check the ones you own. Do you own a modem? I don't have a modem. I have a network card installed but no modem. Uh, CD-ROM, joystick, sound card. Yeah, I got all those. Okay, so this is very thorough. Uh, this is... Thank you, Billy. I bought this from Billy's Comics and Collectibles on eBay. It was a very good price. Check out his website. Or his store, I guess. Might have some things you're interested if you're this far into this video. 
then yeah, there's probably things on there that you would like. Yeah. Okay, let's get this back in the oh, envelope. There we go. One moment as I put this back in here. Huh. Okay. So, then we have here the glorious endangered species that is the user manual. The Comic Collector User Manual. So I'm not going to go really full in depth in this. I'm not going to read the entire thing or anything like that. Uh, this is mostly, I think, technical stuff and telling you how to use it and the different features. So we have uh, what's on the Comic Collector disc. Let's check that out. Uh, welcome to the Comic Collector, featuring data and prices from the Overstreet Comic Book Price Guide. You now have a unique program designed to keep track of your comic collection. The Comic Collector is pr produced by Applesoft, makers of the best-selling sports cards inventory, inventory program, the Card Collector. So if you're interested in uh, sports cards collecting, uh, vintage sports cards, of course, then check that out. Um, every part of this program was designed to make it easy for you, the collector, to manage and control your collection with ease. The Comic Collector lets you use your computer to perform the time-consuming tasks associated with maintaining a large database. You can now make custom reports with the touch of a button or glance through all your comics in an instant. We hope you enjoy the power you now have to manage your collection. Have fun and happy collecting! So this manual is used to explain the Comic Collector, you had to install it, and so on. The Comic Collector maintains a database for over 1,000 titles from the Silver Age to present and over 30,000 comics. Ablesoft also produces Overstreet monthly price data updates for the entire database. If you're interested in updating your current database, use the order forms in the back of this manual or give us a call direct. <sighs> okay, so, yeah, just kind of explains things. Most of it's pretty self-evident so I'm not gonna go through this check out the back page though there's the overstreet price and data updates okay so you order a subscription it looks like I wonder I wonder what that free offer was then uh, so they sell golden age separately I guess that free offer was for maybe like your first update and then you have to get like a subscription for everything else. So for $60 a year, yeah, $60 a year, you can have Silver Age to the present, but they only, okay, they don't do monthly Golden Age, they just do quarterly, which makes sense, I suppose, the older stuff probably doesn't change that much comic cards. That's interesting. They don't have the prices for that listed. Um, but yeah, you can sign up for this and get monthly updates on prices. And That would be a lot cheaper than buying a price guide, like a new price guide every single month. I think that, that would actually be a, not a bad deal. I, if I was a comic collector in 1993, Hell, I, I'd go with this. I'd, I'd try it out. That would be fun. I would love to own a comic shop back then. Uh, that would be so cool. Uh, now I'm getting into the, the whole, like, <laughs> nostalgic for when I was two years old. <laughs> All right, so that is the contents of the box. Let's actually check out the software now. Let's see. Let's get you up here, hopefully. Hopefully it looks okay. So let us I already have it ready. So we just type comic. And here we go. So the comic collector, copyright 1993. There we go. Let's see. I think that I think that looks okay. So we our options here. We have work with the comic database, add definitions, generate reports and lists, change configuration, use utilities, and uh, uh, 
exit program. So the main area, I think, would be, this is version 1.0, uh, work with comic database. And here we have a list of comics. So these are all Silver Age to 1993. So there aren't anything past 1993. Again, I am really curious how far they kept updating this software. Like if, so let's say 1998 was when they ended it or something, like how would you get the data to update it to 1998 to see what new comics came out and did it go to 1998 and what the prices were in 1998? I don't know. I don't know. I, I'll have to do some research on this, see if I can find something. I it seems really obscure. I don't know what I can figure out here, but all right, let's let's search for something. What's a what's a good one? Um, I know. Here, one more. Okay. All right. So right here, we have a copy of the New Mutants issue ninety-eight. This is the first appearance of Deadpool. So back in 1993, what would that cost? <laughs> I imagine it's not very much because the Deadpool movie didn't come out until, oh, what was it, 2016, 2017, 16, I think somewhere around there. Anyway, let's check it out. New Mutants. All right, there we go, the New Mutants. So we have change values, change quantities, change artists. So you can adjust these things. Uh, those are primarily if you want to input your own stuff. So change artist. Uh, actually, I don't know who the artist is for New Mutants number one. I don't even think I have New Mutants number one. Um, anyway, New Mutants number one was worth $7 for a near mint. Um, you can, but yeah, most of this is kind of for inputting your own information because a lot of this is already filled out. Uh, you can list the next 20 comics in the series here. So these are all the prices of the first 20 New Mutants comics. And it has information on there if, it, if there's something specifically like uh, notable, I guess, about the comic. So this is the first appearance of New Warlock, I guess. Here we go. Number 16 is the first appearance of Warpath without his costume. And it also says to look at X-Men 193, which maybe that's the first appearance of Warpath with costume? I don't know. Uh, there's an appearance of Kitty Pride in number 13, although this isn't her first appearance. That was in Uncanny X-Men, I believe. Uh, so yeah. So find comic by number. So here you click that, and we have regular, annual, special, giant size, king size, graphic novel, prestige format, hardcover, softcover, trade paper back, or no number. So you can search all these different categories, but this is just a regular category. So we're looking for 98, and here we go. We have comic number 98, artist is Rob Liefeld. Yep, that's correct. Comments, first appearance of Deadpool, Gideon, and Domino. There you go. Introducing the Lethal Deadpool, uh, what does it say? Mysterious Gideon, and the Dynamic Domino. So Domino and Deadpool were in the second Deadpool movie, um, which that movie increased the price of this a lot. Um, I should have bought more copies of that uh, as like an investment before the movie came out. I was sort of predicting it that it would rate, increase the value of the comic because before the movie came out the comic was worth like maybe fifty dollars and I think now it's like five hundred um, but uh, whatever uh, anyway so uh, yeah back to this so to uh, whoops. so the uh, the comic in 1993 was worth Twelve dollars for near mint, six dollars for fine, or two forty for good condition. All right, so then I can. Let's see, how do I add this? If I do page up, 
or page down, it'll, you know, just go to the next issue. Um, so, 99 is also by Rob Liefeld. It's the first appearance of Feral of X-Force. So, let's see. We have... Next title, search by flags, search for comment. We'll check those things out in a minute. Add comic to title. Okay, so the title is New Mutants. You can add new issues by doing that, I think. Change quantity and range. Okay, that's what you're kind of looking through there. So F1 help, let's see. The three quantity fields consist of only whole numbers between zero and 10,000. Either change quantities. So how do I add it to my my own list, I wonder. Change quantities? Quantity. Uh, mine's in pretty good condition. I think... There we go. Okay, so I just changed the quantity. So it, now it says I have... Oh, I own one. One copy of it. So now, if I exit... And use utilities. Let's see here. What do we have? Delete title. Yeah, edit title information. So this is just editing like the overall categories and files of each uh, comic series, which would be title. And the comics, the specific comic, and then there's artist, writer, index, reports, and list. So here's my. Inventory Summary Report. Uh, do you want to only show the titles you own? Oh, oop, oops. Can I adjust this with this? Uh, yes. Do you want to only show the comics over a given value? No. Only show totals? No. Uh... Okay, so this is your inventory summary. Uh, it looks like I did not actually successfully add it. Equity report, inventory report. Um, so new mutants, look, oh, whoops. New mutants screened, okay. Okay. Add definitions, add title definite, okay. <laughs> So, by number, nine, oh, oops, 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 there we go. So, quantity one. Let's take a look in the book real quick, in the manual. I'm, I'm not sure. Let's see here. So, we have, entering your inventory, page ten. What do we have here? Entering the inventory is the largest task you will tackle. There are several ways to enter the information. Each method is described in detail and is tailored to match your collection. The Comic Collector's database already contains information, titles, prices, authors, writers, publication data, and other important information for most comics. You only need to enter the number of comics you have in your collection. You may also want to set some of the special flags to organize your comics more effectively. Use change quantities. Add title definition, add comic definition, okay. Change quantities. Okay, so I did change the quantity. Um, titles you can work with, the fastest way, okay. Yep, yep. Press plus add. Oh, you can just press the plus key and it'll add it. Okay. Okay. Hmm. And then you can look at... Okay, the next one over. We now have one near mint. Change quantities. Okay. So I did, I did have that right. Alright. I wonder why it didn't show up. Range. So let's look at change quantity in range. Beginning number. Oh, okay. It shows how many near mint, fine and good 
that you own. Add title definition. Definition. I don't think that's really what I'm looking for here. Okay. Well. Alright. So then, add definitions, add title definition. No. Missing inventory report. Inventory report. All. Uh, screen. Okay, okay, here's the inventory report. So now it's just like scanning through everything. It might take a minute. <laughs> so while we're waiting for that, um, how are you guys doing? <laughs> uh, no. Golden Age and Comic Card Data. So you can get. Di looks like you can. If you collect Golden Age comics or comic cards, Ablesoft has the data you need to track your entire collection. Get the data direct from Ablesoft at prices you can afford. Okay. All this data is updated monthly, and Ablesoft's Overstreet price and data update just. Six dollars will get you new prices and data. So you can buy the data for Golden Age comics for twenty dollars. I'm really curious what a lot of Golden Age comics were worth in 1993. Hey, there you go. There you go. Comic, the New Mutants. Check it out. There's my inventory report, and I can print it off uh, if I had a printer hooked up, which I have one downstairs. Dot Matrix. Unfortunately, I don't have it plugged in right now, but. Hey, New Mutants started in 1983, number 100. Was 100 the last issue? I wonder. Anyway, uh, ended in 1991. And we have, uh, it says I own one copy, near mint, of issue number 98. This is awesome. This is so cool. <laughs> I'm so excited about this. I want to go through all my comics and just like, and just put them all into this, and then go on eBay, and make a list of all the prices and put them all in here, and then just print it all out and just keep a. I might actually use this as, as my inventory for my comics. Like, I'm I'm not even joking. I I might actually do this, <laughs> since most of what I collect anyway is. Uh, from the 70s and 80s, uh, particularly with the vintage Star Wars, Marvel Star Wars comics, the Spider-Man comics, Amazing Spider-Man, uh, Uncanny X-Men, New Mutants, uh, the Ghost Rider, the old 80s Ghost Rider stuff. All sorts of stuff. Unfortunately, they don't have 2000 AD in here. Uh, there's very little Judge Dredd, I don't I think. Uh, let's take a... Oh. Oh, okay, so it found... I see, I see, I see. So it found New Mutants and it just kind of stopped there. Now it's going through everything else. I thought it was done. But... Whoops. Um, as I was saying, there, there, there's really not much for, like, British comics in here. This is really uh, uh, United States-centric. Um, yeah, there's, there's like no 2000 AD. Uh, Judge Dredd that they have in here, they have the Fleetway comics and the Eagle comics, uh, printings of some of the, some of the Dredd progs. Grand total, $12, one issue. Sweet. So there's my New Mutants 98. Cool. Um, not gonna do a missing inventory report. That, so what? Would that just like make a list of everything I don't have? That, 
I don't know. Or do you have to add them to... I don't know, because if you're printed out, like, a list of every comic you don't have, <laughs> a, an, an insane list. Um, you can make a want list, though, which is pretty cool, and then you can print that out and take it to conventions or just keep it at your desk when you check eBay. Um... I, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about this. Oh, you can change the color palette. Ooh, look at that. Different colors. Palette one. Ooh, palette one looks kind of cool. I like palette two, though. I like the blue. Turn sound on and off. Change lines per page. That's for printing. Printer port. Yeah. So, let's check out a few more comics. Uh, in 1993, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, Sp okay. Um, Amazing Spider-Man. Let's check out the... Uh, wait. Amazing... That's right. It has a dash in it. Uh, the Amazing Spider-Man. Um, I have issue 298, 299, and 300. Those are really cool issues with Todd McFarlane art. Let's take a look. So let's look at $298, $35. So it wasn't actually that cheap even back then. This was artist Todd McFarlane. Um, B, I'm not sure what B means. I'm sure it explains in the book. But uh, I think it's coloring art, maybe. Anyway, first appearance of Venom without his costume. And that's... $35. I think that issue is maybe around $100 nowadays. I haven't checked in a while, though. Let's look at $299. So that's the first... Uh... Let's see. Uh, I believe it's the first of appearance of Venom with his costume. Which is $20 for Near Mint back in 93. And then the big one, which is like $1,000 now, or higher graded, I have two copies of it, which I've had s since they were new. Like, my brother bought them brand new off the shelf. And then later gave them to me, because he, like, I don't know. Gave me most of his comics, and I am grateful. Because I love collecting things. <laughs> um, so, number 300. First Appearance of Venom in the last black costume. I think this is the last appearance of Spider-Man in the black costume, and the first appearance of Venom uh, as we know him. And that was $55 new, which for, for Near Mint. Um, you still get it for like $10 used, but $55. That, that's not... Like, that. that's... Surprisingly fairly high, I would say. Um, like, yeah, it's gone up a lot since then, but still, it's it's not exactly cheap for 1993. Keep in mind inflation. That's probably... I would say that's at least $200 nowadays, although you can check the inflation rates and different stuff like that. I don't have the information in front of me. But I'm guessing that $55.93 would have been probably about $200 now. But, yeah. Anyway, that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, let's look for... Um, well, let's see what happens if we search for a Golden Age comic. So let's search for, like, uh, Detective Comics. So we have Detective Comics here. Okay, so the earliest issue it shows is 217. That is the first code approved issue, which is worth $200 back then. And so here are some of the prices of. These are the first 20 that are listed here. Looks like Martian Manhunter John Jones, number 225, $2,500. Wow. 233. Is that the first appearance of Batwoman? $775? I bet that's a lot more money now. I mean, I know it's a lot more money now, but I, I don't know how much more. Still, really, really cool. 
really cool, I think. Um, I'm going to search for Judge Dredd because it's my favorite comic series and I collect Judge Dredd. You can maybe even see up there. There's my Dredd collection. Yes. <laughs> I am the law. Well, he's the law. I'm not the law. I'm just some guy on YouTube. So we have Eagle Quality. And we have $2 for 1986. Uh, view list next 20. Okay. Boland. Brian Boland, one of the early Dread artists. So, they're cheap. I think they're still cheap. Not much of a difference there. And we'll check out Judge Dread Fleetway. And list next 20. So, we have Brian Boland again up there. That's the only information. That's $9. And the rest of these all say $3. So. Who knows? Who knows? Not a very common and not a very valued comic, I suppose. Let's look at Terminator. What do we have here? Uh, Terminator 2 Judgment Day. That was pretty new at this time, I think. I wonder... Okay. They're very cheap. Very cheap. Like... A dollar. <laughs> so... Terminator 2, Judgment Day, by Marvel. Okay, so, I want to show off something else here. Let's look at Uncanny X-Men. So, let's say I want to find what the first issue of... First appearance of Gambit is, because that's also one that I own. Uh, I don't remember the number of it, though. Also, um... Uncanny X-Men number one, two thousand dollars back then. I would, yeah, wow, that's. I would love to have a, a copy of that. That's awesome. Jack Kirby, Stan Lee, first appearance of the X-Men, <laughs> and first appearance of Magneto, and the first appearance of Professor X. That is an awesome issue to have. High demand, still in high demand take a look here so there's the first issue and you can see the prices of all the following issues the, the following uh, 20 issues or so pretty pretty cool I think so I wanna find comic by number nope I don't know the I don't know the number that is the first appearance of Gambit I could just you know flip through like this but there's a lot of issues in Uncanny X-Men so, I don't know. I don't know. So, what we're going to do is we're going to search for comment. See, these are the comments. We're going to search for comment. So, if it has the first appearance of Gambit, it would probably say 1 colon Gambit. So, let's just type in Gambit. Find first comment match. There you go. Number 266. Artist Mike Collins, writer Chris Claremont. First appearance of Gambit. It was twenty-five dollars back in nineteen ninety-three. I don't know what it's worth now. It's it's not a hugely expensive issue. I don't think it, maybe hundred, two hundred, possibly. Um, we can find the next comment match. See if there's any like special appearance of Gambit later on. Uh, annual number fourteen. It's a minor first appearance of Gambit. Five pages. Okay, so eight dollars, and that's that's all that's listed. So that's those are the only like important gambit issues. So we can also define a comment. Let's say we want to find the first appearance of. Ooh, who's a character who kind of showed up? Uh, let's go with Kitty. Kitty Pride. First appearance of Kitty Pride was one hundred and twenty-nine. I might have this issue. I I'd have to double check. Which would be nice. I could I could go through my inventory and plug everything in here and then see what I have. If I want to say like, oh, do I have that one? I don't know. Go on here and do that. I, I think this is an awesome bit of software. I, I really, really like this. And I would really like to get the updated, the updated uh, software uh, floppies for this. Uh, that would be awesome. 
I'll have to look online and see if I can find any, or if any of you have it, I would be extremely grateful if, if you could share that, those files. Anyway, um, yeah, so find next comment, there's Kitty Pride Joins, so Kitty Pride joins the X-Men, I guess, in issue 139. Uh, appearance with Alpha Flight, and I'm not sure what N means, but Wolverine is involved. Looks like a high demand issue. So, what about Pyro? Uh, maybe, oh, he might be one of the new mutants. I forget. Um, Juggernaut. Juggernaut. There we go. Issue 12. The first appearance of Juggernaut. $100 back then. Pretty cool, I think. Pretty cool. Um, yeah, so look at that. And let's see here. So you can okay, increase, decrease quantity. Cool. And you can click next title. That will change the top, so this is changing the series that you're looking at. Now, instead of the Uncanny X-Men, we're looking at the Uncensored Mouse. I don't know what that is. Reprints of early Mickey Mouse strips by Gottfrieds. Oh, okay. Well, that's cool. It tells you what it is. Barks Begin. Uncle Scrooge Adventures by Gladstone. That's cool. Underdog. The Unexpected. Unity. Valiant. Okay. Here's another cool one we can look up. Spawn, that was always one of my favorites as a kid. Uh, one that my brother was really into. So, the first issue of Spawn. High demand, $10. And I think it's gone up a lot since then. Um, to you edit public data. Oh, and it shows right here. July 1992. Image Comics. Cool, cool. I was wondering if I could see the date released. So, let's look at the next 20 comics. It looks like when this was published, this software, there were only 12 issues out. And if it started in 1992, that would make sense that, you know, it was only a year later that there would only be 12 issues out. <laughs> so this is pretty early in, in Image Comics history here. But that's cool that they, they include it. Uh, none of these have really gained... Uh, have gained value as of the printing of... Printing? Uh, input of this software data. So I do have... Copies... Oh, oops. Okay, so I do have a very nice condition of spawn number one. So we'll do that. Spawn 1A. Oh, I don't know if I have the reprint. I probably do, but I don't know. I do have number two, number three. I have all of these. Uh, yeah, I think I even have the posters. I should double check the... Frank Miller. Oh yeah, there's the Frank Miller. The early Spawn was kind of interesting because they had a bunch of different writers come in from other comic series and whatnot to do uh, to you know, to to write an issue and to introduce their own character or something. Uh, so you had issue eight. There was like a whole string of them. I think it was like six issues maybe, starting in issue eight where they had a new. Uh, writer come in and did kind of crossover stuff. So issue 8 you had Alan Moore. Issue 9 was Neil Gaiman. That was the the issue that introduced Angela um, who became a recurring character in in Spawn. Uh, Dave Sim, issue 10 with Cerebus which was a really weird one with Spawn going into Cerebus world and weird like Cerberus was narrating and it was like this really weird like comical world. I, it's a weird issue. It's one of the more weird like surreal I guess issues of Spawn. And then there's Frank Miller and then okay maybe it was only like four issues but it was Todd McFarlane. 
pretty cool. Um, yeah. I'm wondering... Okay, there's a comic... Okay, so that's if you want to add your own stuff, I think. Artist list. Um, generate... Farland? No. No, I'm not exactly sure what I'm doing with that. Uh, McFarlane. Can I... No. Let's look at Masters of the Universe. Was there a Masters of the Universe comic here? No, but there is the Max! How many issues were out? Three issues were out at this point. <laughs> okay, that's pretty cool. The Adventures of Bob Hope! The Adventures of Jerry Lewis. <laughs> Planet of the Apes. Oh, let's look at uh, Star Wars. So, we have... There you go. This was Star Wars Marvel. The regular 30 cent edition is the 1 to 6 movie ad adaptation. Yeah, that one is still pretty cheap. At least the diamond. I believe it has a diamond on it. It's a reprint. And the 35 cent with the UPC code. That one is extremely expensive now. I would love to have a copy of that. I am unfortunately missing that one from my set. I have almost a complete set of this, including some of the some of the uh, newspaper clippings from the LA Times, where they published Star Wars comics in there. And I have some of the actual clippings. I may show those off in another video if anyone is interested in seeing those. I could show off my uh, Marvel Star Wars comic collection. Um, also, since I'm talking about that, uh, I got a letter to the editor published in, uh, I believe it was issue 10 of the new Marvel Star Wars comic. The, um, it was the one that started about five years ago. Um, but the, you know, the, 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 the one that I believe is still ongoing, but... Issue 10, I think it's the one with the Rancor on the front. I I wrote to them, and they printed my letter to the editor. I was very proud of that. <laughs> <coughs> so, check that out if you are interested. This is awesome. I, I just, I love this. I might actually even add in my own comic series here uh, for, like, later stuff, you know, things that were printed after 1993, because there's a lot of comics printed after 1993. Um, yeah, I think that that might be really cool. Uh, I'm just, I'm so excited about this. I think this is, I think this is awesome. I, I love the software. I don't know if there's anything, like, like this that's been created more recently. I imagine there would be, but I just really like the format of it, and I don't know, I feel... For the most part, fairly comfortable with it. Still a few things I think I may need to learn, I guess. Like, how to search by artist or something. Ooh, check this out! Batman and Judge Dredd, Judgment on Gotham. That's an awesome one. By John Wagner. One of the creators of Judge Dredd. Oh, that's such a good issue. That is such a good one. Uh, Seven dollars, and it was yeah, it was it was just a one-off that they did. <coughs> Surprised that didn't come up when I searched for Judge Dredd. So Judge Dredd, Judge Dredd, right here. Oh, okay, Judge. Okay. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, I wonder why that didn't come up. Cause we have Batman, Judge Dredd. Interesting. I, I, don't, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll have to play around with it a bit and figure it out. There's still some things. Ooh, Conan the Barbarian! Conan! Oh, those ones are pretty expensive now, aren't they? And these were... Let's see, what is... 
View public data. Yeah, October 1970. Savage Sword of Conan. Okay, let's let's take a look at that. Let's look at Savage Sword of Conan. Here we go. Here we go. These are awesome. I I love I love Conan. Conan is really cool. 1974 to present. Okay, Marvel Comics. Uh, let's go back. Let's go back to the other one. Conan the Barbarian. So this was issue one. Is was $185. Low distribution in some areas for issue three. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool. I, I would I would say. If you have anything that you want to know what the value was back in 1993, let me know. Well, here's the Blade Runner comic. The super special. It was a dollar. <laughs> I don't think it's very expensive right now. It's just a movie adaptation into comic. Um, what was it like two issues? Yeah, two issues. It was... It basically, it was the movie in comic form. That, that's all it was. Kind of like uh, Marvel Star Wars 1 through 6. And then they introduced the weird bunny man in issue 7. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, hey, Deadpool. Let's check that out. Here we go. For the first issue of Deadpool. This was... Oh, wow, this came out 1993. So this would have been brand new when this came out. And, yeah, there there was only two issues at this time. Pretty neat. Uh, Dr. Solar, Dr. Strange. I know he's pretty popular nowadays. Well, with the movie and all. Uh, Doctor Who? That's pretty cool. Donald Duck. Doom 2099. I don't think that has anything to do with the game. Because Doom came out this year, actually. 1993. Elf Lord, Elf Quest. I think I have some old Elf Quest comics somewhere. Dynamo. Dynamo's pretty neat. Enigma. Excalibur. There's Fantastic Four. See, what was the original... Ooh, first... Of... Oh, jeez. Yeah. So the first issue of Fantastic Four, which was 1961, $7,400. It's probably a lot more money nowadays. I don't think I have any of these. I, I own very few uh, uh, Silver Age comics. Most of my stuff is Bronze Age and Copper Age. I have one Golden Age comic. I actually have the artwork for it. Here. While I'm at... Um, actually, no, I don't need to unscrew you. Here we go. Let's just unplug the power cable. And here's my room. Ah, oh, dog toy. Here we go. Here. Here is my... The um, original artwork plate. And there is the page from the comic. It's kind of cool. I like it. But I do have that comic. It was not expensive. It's pretty, pretty cheap. Like a, I want to say a, it was like five dollars when I bought it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, this has probably gone on long enough. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you're interested in vintage comic stuff or just curious, it's a neat little novelty. Um, I may actually use this. Uh, just because I'm weird and eccentric like that, I guess. <laughs> but... Hope you enjoyed this video, found it informative, um, hope it was interesting. 
If you want to see anything more like this, if you want to see more comics, let me know. If you don't care about comics and you want to see something else, then yeah, whatever. Just tell me what you think. Anyways, thanks for watching. Hope you had a fun time. I sure did. I'll see you later. Bye-bye.